Please join me in welcoming to the podium our moderator for the panel this evening, a proud native son of Australia and adopted son of Pittsburgh, Mr. Grant Oliphant. Grant. Thank you. Yes, my daughter's here this evening, so you have to be nice to me. It is, uh, it's true, I'm a native of Australia, and there's really nothing worse in the world than being a native of Australia and not having the accent. It is, um, I could have been so much cooler if I'd, if, I'd been, if I'd been able to hold on to that. My folks um, made the decision to move from Australia to the United States when I was three years old, and they made the even crazier choice of Denver, Colorado, which is literally where local newscasters send their newscasters to train so that they can kill any accents that they have. And um, it's a great place to wipe out accents. So I, uh, I actually had somebody look at me once and say, you're not from Australia, when I claimed that I was. And, and I, I said, why not? And he said, well, because they're taller and funnier than you are. <laughs> so. Um, Apologies, this is the version of Australian that you get. Uh, but it's a great pleasure for me. And actually, this, this conversation um, and presentation from the Prime Minister was touching for me on a, on a personal level for reasons that I'm going to explain in a second when I turn to one of our first panelists. But I, um, I do want to just quickly say this is not going to be a long panel discussion. We're going to try to do this in about 35 to 40 minutes. We have. Um, five panelists, and uh, I'm going to be asking them a, a quick series of questions, and then we're going to turn to you uh, to ask any questions that you might have, and I apologize in advance. Um, two rules. Uh, one is not a lot of questions because we won't have time, and the second is questions, not speeches. So um, we'll invite you to, to pose any questions that you might have to the panelists um, and invite them to give us their feedback. Uh, I was, I was joking with Pradeep Kosla earlier about the fact that, you know, this is an unusual sort of um, format. You know, he, he said, I've heard of warm-up acts. You guys are kind of like the cool-down <laughs> acts. So, um, but I think I'm, I'm fascinated by the, by the uh, group that we have here today. And, and just very quickly, and I'm going to say a little something about each one as I ask them a question, but just quickly so that you know who they are. Um, Dr. Peter Cook, Dr. Lester Lave. Um, Audrey Russo, I, Audrey, I think you and I are the only ones who aren't doctors in the, in the, in the group. Uh, Dr. Kyron Skinner and Dr. Mark Wessel. And I want to thank you all for being here this evening. And as I said, I'll say a little bit more um, before we dive in. Um, I do want to turn to, we're going to talk about the G20 and we're going to talk about um, Australia in the context of the G20 and then the G20 and then I hope um, really tie it back to Pittsburgh and and how we can relate to um, this experience and where we go from here. Um, but I want to start with a, a, a question that really struck me as I was listening to the Prime Minister present. And I, I have to say, this is the first time that I've had an Australian Prime Minister stand up at, where I felt like, wow, there's a real leader standing up. And um, you know, when I was, when I was uh, growing up in Australia, when I was um, three years old, I used to have people laugh at me and, and, and describe me derogatorily as a new Australian because I had blonde hair. And in those days, Australia was a sort of place where people from outside were not very welcome. And somebody who looked like me was considered to be an outsider in Australia in those days. So something has happened to the concept of Australianness, of how we, of how we think about, how Australians think about their place in the world such that you can now have an Australian Prime Minister stand up and not only talk about the right values and, the, and, and, and important um, priorities in the world, but offer his country up to provide leadership on it. So I want to turn to Peter Cook, who um, is, is one of Pittsburgh's most recent and impressive Australian imports. He's now the head of the renowned School of Drama at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and he came from the National Institute of Dramatic Art in Sydney, where he was the deputy director and head of design for 22 years. But he's also done a lot of work in this concept of Australianness. So, Peter, I want to ask you, what's happened to the idea of, that Australians have of themselves in the world that we could have a leader like that stand up and deliver the talk that he did today? Well, 
It's very nice to be here. And I, I would agree with you that I was sitting there thinking, this is a terrific event. And to see somebody that you have voted for, which I did, um, stand up and speak as eloquently, passionately, uh, as well researched, and as convincingly and charmingly delivered as he did, I thought this is a terrific moment for, for me and, and for Australia. Um, I, I'm of an age where I had three Prime Ministers, uh, Gough Whitlam, Paul Keating and now Kevin Rudd in the Labor Party side of things that were great art supporters. They were great with education and they were uh, progressive and imaginative thinkers. And I think to see him today here, and, and you know, Australia is a small country, it's 22 million people, uh, coming into the G20 and you think that will be a substantial voice and it will be a powerful voice and uh, it's just a, a tremendous thing to feel. Unfortunately, Australia, with 22 million people, has X number of opportunities for people. And I worked at a theatre company, for a, a theatre school, for a long, long time. And, you know, the world sort of opened up and I left. Uh, a lot of Australians do leave because opportunities uh, are out there and there are wonderful things to do. In my time at, in Australia, all my education was free. The government paid for everything, and I did up to PhD. I did not pay, my parents did not pay a single dollar except at boarding school, the private school that I went to. But in university, it was free. And, you know, that is changing. We we're just talking to the treasurer outside uh, before we came in, and, you know, there are fees now creeping in. And my opportunity and my ability to be able to sit here and do what I'm doing at the school and the things that I've done came through my education, which was given to me by the government. So there was some very enlightened thinking, and I just think we're very lucky to have this man at the helm of the country, and uh, things are looking good. Okay, I'm going to uh, leap for a second down to the opposite end of the panel and ask Mark Wessel, who's been on the faculty of the Heinz College for 16 years, served as dean of the college from 2003 to 2008, um, it was during his leadership of the Heinz College that, uh, that, that the college established a presence in South Australia, in Adelaide, in fact, uh, my hometown. And um, he spent time there learning how not to wear a tie and, to, and, to, um, and learning how to surf. Uh, and uh, Mark, I just, ha has, you've seen the, the perspective from Australia. Have, has Australia's identity and its sense of itself and its role in the world changed in your perspective? Oh, I, I think it has, and I, I don't know when this occurred, but it's very striking when you're there, the degree to which Australia has a conscious view of itself as firmly resting between two worlds, if you will. It understands that its historical and its cultural connections and its current, uh, mo and its dominant current economic and political connections tie to the United States and to Europe and to the OECD countries by and large, but it equally understands that its future is tied to the Asia Pacific region. And its policy frameworks are consistent, I think, across both um, the labor and the liberal parties in uh, focusing on the role it plays and the comparative advantage it has as a nation in uh, mediating the global dialogue between those two great places in the world, the, the, if you will, the past and the future of, uh, of the world. And uh, I think it's a remarkable, it's one of the most remarkable policy choices in a, in a grand scheme of choices that I think I've, I've seen a nation make. And it manifests itself in many, many ways. The, you heard the Aussades, uh, the, the mention of the Aussades scholarships. This is a program where the, the Australian government provides support for for students from all around the Asia Pacific region, mostly from um, emerging societies, underdeveloped countries, to come to Australia and do education. Their only possible goal in doing this is to, is to convince these people that they believe will be future leaders of their society that Australia is part of the future of Indonesia and Pakistan and Cambodia and Vietnam and all of these, uh, these uh, locations in this, in this incredibly important region in the world. So a, a sense then of connectedness with the world and a real appreciation for um, sort of the opposite dynamic that I experienced 45 years ago. I want to turn now to Dr. Kyron Skinner, who's Associate Professor of Social and Decision Sciences at Carnegie Mellon 
and director of the International Relations and Politics Program, which I understand is one of the fastest growing majors here at Carnegie Mellon, which I, I find absolutely thrilling. Um, a specialist as well in U.S. foreign policy. Uh, so I'd be, I'd be curious to get your perspective now on the broader issue of all these world leaders coming to the G20 in Pittsburgh and what we ought to be thinking about that um, in the context of the Prime Minister's speech. Well, the G20, I can give some history of the G20, which I think will be helpful to understand what actually um, is going to take place and um, why it's happening here in Pittsburgh. Um, the G20 actually grew out of a small um, informal meeting that st um, happened in the basement, um, li the basement of the White House in a small library in March of 1973. The um, U.S. Secretary of the Treasury at the time, um, realizing that uh, the economic crisis that the U.S. was facing was truly a global one, having gone off the bread and wood system, the major currencies by 73 were floating against each other. Um, and there was an impending um, OPEC crisis, the first major one. So the um, foreign, um, tr the finance ministers of the U.S., of um, the U.K., France, and West Germany met in this basement room, dubbed themselves the library group. It was to be an informal entity um, that would consult periodically to talk about coordinating international economic policy. Um, within two years, they'd added J Japan and Italy and. Um, had a major summit in, in 75, and then in 76, Canada joined, the G7 was born. What the G20 is, is and the G7 now, um, the G8, by the end of the 1990s, Russia had joined the independent country of Russia. Um, and then in the late 1990s, in the face of the um, Asian economic crisis, um, the G20 was formed as a parallel organization the G7 and G8 include only the major industrialized nations, um, and the G20 was to include those um, fast developing powerhouse economies um, um, in what was once called the third world. So to bring them into conversation with the developed economies. What we now have in the G7, G8, and the G20 is nothing like the library group, which was to be an informal consultative um, entity that didn't necessarily collude to make policy that would affect the um, IMF, World Bank, um, GATT, OECD, um, but that's what we now have, a more formal structure that still claims to be informal. There's no permanent um, office building, there's no secretariat, there's no permanent staff, yet we have a, you know, a G system where major decisions are being made. Um, and even if they aren't considered um, decisions, the commitments made at these meetings are so path dependent for the more established institutions um, that one has to wonder what actually is the future of this, um, of this kind of um, international organizing. It's mo much beyond international symmetry. Mm -hmm. It's become um, kind of important for deep policy discussions. It all started around economic issues, and if you look at what they, is said on paper about these, um, the G system. It's supposed to be about international economics, but the G8 meeting in Italy this summer was dominated by climate change, and it uh, will be virtually impossible in the wake of the UN meeting for this meeting to be limited just to climate change and issues of financial regulation. Um, Iran is an important issue. You can't talk really in some ways about um, trying to get a consensus with China on climate change if you don't talk about trying to bring China into the discussion on Iran, if the meetings next month um, stall um, that are to take place about trying to get um, a, a stop to Iran's nuclear program. So the G system has this odd history of an informal meeting that's become a now still an informal body that doesn't want to claim that it's a formal institution. The G20 is actually just a meeting in, um, of the finance ministers and central bankers of the countries. But in the past year, in less than a year, we've had three leader summits. Um, last November in Washington, April in London, and now in Pittsburgh. So it's growing um, beyond its original mission, and there is a call to expand the G20 to the G20 to the G33. Some want to make it the G192, the full membership of the UN, um, which um, I think would be a disaster, but um, it, it may We don't have enough hotel rooms for um, you, I And, and, and the, if that, that probably won't happen soon, but the G8 is, 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 will probably be history within a couple of years because of the pressure of the new G5 
um, plus Egypt, and I always try to remember the G5. I look to Sylvia to tell me what is it. It's Br Brazil, Russia, uh, India. And, no, it's not. It's not Ru um, Russia's in the G8. Brazil, India, South Africa, Mexico. It's, what else? Did I get it? I get. I got. Well, I came close. Plus, plus <laughs> Egypt. I, it's not that I can't count. It will be the G14. So the G8. There's a big serious move. Um, by the, uh, um, the Italians, the British, not the British, the Italians, the Germans, and the French to replace the G8 with the G14, to give the developing, the fast-growing um, developing economies a place at the table in discussions uh, around international economic policy. That may be fine. Um, I understand the desire. That some of this is self-evident. Now Mexico and Spain surpass in terms of GDP um, um, Canada, a member of the G8. Um, South, um, South Korea is right behind Canada, so one can understand why these countries would want to join. But the spirit in which some of this is being done kind of belies reality. Um, the communiques say that we are now in a multipolar world, and that the and I think they're confusing multipolarity with multilateral institutions that have lots of members. Um, the fact of the matter is that the United States still is. Um, um, has the lion's share of defense spending in the world, has an incredible fighting force, um, and is only surpassed in GDP um, described in terms of purchasing power parity by the European Union. Pull Germany out of the EU and it's a very different ball game. Um, and not just that you describe, describe power in terms of economic might and military power, but polarity is not the same as um, uh, multilateralism in terms of institutions. So I think there's a way in which the developing nations are trying to create a reality that doesn't exist um, through the G system. So that's where we are, and I think we'll have a huge agenda beyond climate change and economic issues in the discussions in the next two days. I want to come back to this concept of everybody scrambling to get into this club and whether it's really worth it. But mm -hmm. I want to I want to turn um, for a moment to Lester Lave, who is the Harry B. and James H. Higgins Professor of Economics at the Tepper School of Business, um, University Professor. He's co-director of the Carnegie Mellon Electricity Industry Center. Uh, he's actually been um, one of my heroes for quite a while in my time at the Heinz Endowments because of the work that he's done in advancing thinking around energy and environmental issues uh, and and related policy. Um, Lester, the Prime Minister laid out a very ambitious agenda, uh, one that he partly controls and one that's heavily dependent on persuading uh, a, a host of other countries to play along, including the United States. Uh, is, is, is his uh, ambitious agenda reasonable? Are we going to see the sort of progress that he's outlining? Uh, and, and how important is the United States cooperation going to be on this? First of all, Grant, I'm blushing. <laughs> uh, I've spent the last two years of my life uh, chairing an energy efficiency panel for the National Academy of Sciences and National Academy of Engineering. And I felt that I could have written part of Prime Minister Rudd's uh, speech. Uh, the conclusion of the uh, committee that looked at America's energy future is that energy efficiency is the nearest term and the cheapest energy option that we have in the United States. My specific panel's conclusions were that uh, if you looked at what the forecast use of energy in the United States is going to be in 2030 by the Department of Energy, uh, it's a, an increase from 101 quadrillion BTUs today to 118 quadrillion BTUs then. Our conclusion is that we can save both money and energy by implementing energy efficiency that would take us down to about 81 or 82 quadrillion BTUs by 2030. That would take us back to levels of energy consumption in the United States that were typical in the 1980s. If you remember at Kyoto, our commitment at Kyoto was to reduce our energy levels below 1990 levels. And currently, I think if you hear the discussions around, you'll hear that that's almost impossible, that, that we just can't do that. And so my panel is saying that we could both save money and save uh, energy by uh, getting to these levels. Uh, he also indicated how Australia was overcoming some of the barriers to getting there. And my panel has uh, recognized that those barriers are really quite formidable. There are parts of the United States, such as California and New York, 
that have done a really good job in overcoming those barriers. So for example, electricity consumption per capita in both California and New York is 40%, 40% below the national average, below Pennsylvania, right? And so we might be able to scoff at California, but New York State, the state just north of us, has managed to uh, cut electricity use per capita 40% below what it is we do here. So what I'm saying is that the targets of how to achieve uh, our, our energy efficiency, how we can reduce our energy use, uh, are quite achievable. There are things that we can do. We can get to those, uh, those goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, certainly in the United States and probably in the world, uh, by simply being more intelligent about the way in which we use energy. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, Audrey, I'm not going to ask you to tie all these different strings together. We're going we're <laughs> to we're going to come back to that in a moment. But you've been you've been involved in a number of events over the past couple of days, uh, including the um, presentation from the head of Google here yesterday. Uh, you've been observing what's been happening at the G20, and in your capacity as head of the Pittsburgh Technology Council. I'm curious what you see as the opportunities for Pittsburgh that you've been hearing about that are emerging for us as a region. Well, I, you know, a um, couple of things. One is, um, even with Eric Schmidt spending the day with us yesterday, one of the biggest issues that they have is the energy that they use in uh, their environment for the farms that are, you know, all over the U.S. and around the world. Energy is one of the things that they lose sleep over. So when uh, Eric was asked, what is it that you know, troubles you the most, it is how are we going to be able to fuel all the servers of this information that we have? And guess what? By the way, we're buying land. And we're buying land so that we can cover the amount of spend that we have. But we're very much passionate about how we figure this out. So uh, you know, even though you look at um, you know, the emerging of technology and the the kinds of things that are happening in our region, wow, isn't that pretty fantastic? Many of the people in the audience said, you didn't realize that uh, that was troubling Google and that's something that haunts them. So that's, that's on a recent one. But I think in terms of the G20 is it's very important for this region and, and Pittsburghers don't do this well and many of you have heard this, they don't do it well. We're very, um, we're working hard trying to solve hard problems with some of the smartest people that I've seen, and I'm not a native Pittsburgher, but I, but I certainly love it here, solving hard problems that are gonna change the world. But one of the things that we're not very good at is sharing that and talking about that in a way that breaks it down into practicality. So the luxury that we have right now is to take advantage of the opportunity to talk about it and to show and to demonstrate our wares, just like we did with the Prime Minister, showing him the kinds of capabilities that we have in robotics. And being comfortable with that is something that I have noticed that Pittsburghers are not. And in Australia, I've spent a lot of time in Australia, and, and the term was, don't be the tall poppy. And because the tall poppy always gets raised. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of the things that happens here in Pittsburgh, is that, you know, don't shine, don't talk too much about it. Let's just really work hard and show them, and they will come. Well, you know what, the world is, um, pretty global and information flies very fast and yet being the tall poppy isn't so bad and innovation means that you make a lot of mistakes and it does get a little messy and from time to time you have to be the tall poppy and I think this gives us the opportunity not for this day but to create relationships that transcend these two days that we're all together. Esther, I'm curious if you can, um, I, I love this, that, that line about the tall poppy, and it is, it is actually an aphorism that actually goes back 40 or 50 years in Australia. Um, and I, I'm curious, Lester, if you see uh, emerging out of the conversations that are happening in Pittsburgh now, unique opportunities for this region to provide leadership on the energy and, and, and climate front. Well, Pittsburgh uh, has reinvented itself since the steel industry shut down. And all we have to do is look around the region to see that there are many other cities close to us that were in exactly the same position as we are that have not reinvented themselves. And so it's not automatic that once you get knocked down and get your nose bloodied that you're going to stand up and be able to do something. And so Pittsburgh has done that. And it has done that uh, because of the leadership of people like Grant, 
uh, because of the local foundations, because of the people of Pittsburgh. And so I think we have an enormous opportunity to go on from here, to look forward to what it is that we can do, taking advantage of the advantages that we have. The first and primary advantage is that it's western Pennsylvania. We have these three huge rivers here. It's an inherently beautiful place as we manage to clean up from our not so beautiful past. Beyond that, we've got uh, the universities, we've got the medical centers, we've got uh, all of the technology that's being spun off from here. So I think that the answer is overwhelmingly yes, that we are in a position to lead the United States and the rest of the world to provide jobs. And as I said uh, a few minutes ago, not providing jobs by messing up the countryside, which is what happened 150 years ago, but rather by providing jobs by figuring out how it is we're going to make the world a better place to live instead of just a richer place to live. I want to invite the audience to ask any questions that you might have, um, but for the sake of the, of the rest of us so that we can hear you, there are microphones on either side, and if you could come up to one and pose your question there. Uh, just very quickly before this first question, I do want to turn to Kyron and come back to this, this concept of the agenda being much bigger than climate change and everybody wanting to get into this club, uh, the G Club. And by the way, I, there, was a, there was a logo circulating before the G20 happened that I thought we really should have used and we missed an opportunity and it was G20 and at. And I think we just should have used it. But um, why, why, does everybody wanna, why does everybody want to be in the, in the G Club? And do, do, does anything happen at these meetings, really? Okay, um, a lot does actually happen. Um, by 1978, um, the third meeting or so of the G system, um, they, um, the members were issuing, issuing political communiques largely about combating and te um, international terrorism and coordinating policies on security matters. By 1983 at the Williamsburg Summit, it became the defining moment um, despite the fact that um, the um, U.S. and much of the Western world was pulling out of a, a, um, a recession. It became the defining moment in figuring out um, how the rest of the Cold War would be fought. So decisions are actually made. And at the, at the April G20 summit in London, $750 billion um, 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 was put forth to go to the IMF. Um, and so um, for, for um, countries in crisis. So it big decisions are made at an informal body that have a huge impact on more formal institutions and on countries that aren't part of, of the um, G20 system. That's part of the reason that other countries want to be in this, um, this growing entity um, because they're excluded from some important conversations. Thank you. All right. So. Um the good fortune goes with the brave. If you're standing at a microphone right now, we'll be able to take your question. Uh, you want to start? Sure. My name is Ben Town, and I'm a graduate student in School of Computer Science here. The theme of tonight's panel discussion was innovation and the global economy. And I know that Audrey hosted a wonderful event for us yesterday with Eric Schmidt and uh, some great discussion on this topic. I was wondering if each of the panelists could describe a particular innovation or area for innovation, whether that be in policy, in technology, in science, in energy, uh, discuss a particular innovation that would really help spur on the global economy that uh, could be discussed here at the G20. Okay, question, questioners like him are a moderator's dream and nightmare <laughs> because I don't have to pick which one of you to answer this question because he's challenged all five of you to answer this question, but I have to ask you all to be very brief in, in providing your example of an innovation that you would point to. Mark, you want to start? Yeah, so uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I'll, I'll try and tackle it at least uh, uh, very quickly from the policy dimension. I think uh, if you think about this economic crisis and the debate that's gone on, whether that debate is around the use of macroeconomic policy, whether monetary policy or fiscal stimulus or whatever, to uh, respond to this, whether the debate's around financial regulation, whether the debate's around the nature of globalization and its benefits and costs and how we deal with some of the 
more pernicious externalities that are not a direct result of globalization but are associated with globalization, like, like in the environmental impacts, the, the, it, it's become clear that a mechanism for coordinated, serious coordinated response across the major economic powers that are represented at the G20 uh, remains kind of the holy grail from an, from an economics perspective uh, in a world that has become so deeply interconnected. There's lots of talk about it. They're talking about financial regulation, for example. Everybody's got a plan. Secretary Geithner's put forward a, forth a financial regulation plan. He seems to be uh, capable of driving it, at least through the G20, to, to uh, some consensus. But whether we actually take that consensus or the consensus around uh, the, the failure of the Doha round, Doha trade rounds, or the consensus that seems to exist, at least in principle, around uh, environmental uh, uh, issues and global warming, whether we can actually take that back into the national political agenda and the national political realms and take what are really hard steps in each of those cases to manifest that global cooperation in the context of our national policy. That's the, that's the real challenge for innovation at the policy level that I see going forward. Okay. Um, plan statement, but as I heard my colleague um, make his um, um, definition of innovation, it kind of changed a little bit of what I want to say. And I think you're absolutely right that the domestic audience cost of these decisions that and commitments that are made at the international level are the real asset test of the future of globalization. Um, it's one thing to go to an international meeting and commit to um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the next 50 years. All states have declared they want to do that. Um, that happened in the past two days at the UN. But then when leaders return home, as um, India faced um, this summer, it made big commitments around solar power only to face a lot of domestic opposition um, because of concern of what it will do to jobs and economic growth. So the domestic part of ec um, globalization is something we often don't talk about at these meetings. Um, but understanding um, the domestic component and how domestic audiences are concerned about jobs and, um, and the impact that globalization and um, environmental policies will have upon them, I think is, is a, an important dimension of, of, um, of globalization. And anyone who can fix that problem, um, that's the key innovative measure, I think, then they pick up a prize. Thank you. Uh -huh. That's good. Audrey? Uh, obviously, I'm more of a pragmatist in terms of uh, how I view the world here, and I'm looking at in terms of Pittsburgh and Southwestern PA. You know, who who am I to answer the question in terms of, you know, what will, what's the next pocket of innovation and where where the opportunities are? I can tell you though that it is what we have an opportunity locally, and where I see the most um, creative forces for growth, because I think it's right. Everyone talks about you know, energy, and we have the opportunity here, and we're the, we could be the Saudi Arabia of the world, et cetera. I also hear that in other states. And I'm not saying that we don't have an opportunity here, and it's real, and we have resources, and we have smart people, and, you know, the, the opportunities abound. But what's the most interesting, and where I've seen the most progress, and it's not necessarily tied to a particular cluster, it is the marriage of the unusual. And the marriage of the unusual means what you see when you know, robotics is working in healthcare, when you see that you know, telecommunications and opportunity in healthcare. For, you know, I'm just picking up an area that I know that you know, Obama administration is near and dear to their heart. We, we have the opportunity here in Pittsburgh to make huge dents and strides in that. But the policy implications are pretty profound because we are not dealing with, in the US right now, the issues of immigration. And so while we attract the best and brightest, and particularly right here in our backyard, we are not, we're sending those same fantastic people home as they're working with some of the best and brightest faculty who are you know, d you know, discovering and are testing and are validating, and then they leave. And I'm, I'm troubled when we talk about globalization and that we don't really understand what it means in terms of immigration, in migration, and globalization. Thank you. Lester and Peter, unless you have a burning answer to this question that you want to give, do you? I want to. Let, let me do something very quick. Okay. 
I, I, I think that one of the policy innovations that's needed is to have political leaders understand uh, the underlying economics of things. We have people declaring all sorts of bold visions, uh, making commitments to technologies which are far too expensive for what it is they want to do, and so the things fall flat. Uh, so on the one hand, we need to be imaginative. On the other hand, the damn politicians need to know what it's going to cost <laughs> so that we can know whether your commitment to that is going to work. So <coughs> Prime Minister Rudd and, and President Obama can say whatever it is they want, unless the things that they're talking about are, are things that are inexpensive enough so the country can afford them, then all the grand rhetoric is going to go nowhere. Okay, Peter, I've, I've given everybody else a shot. Okay, Peter. well, I, I, I mean, I have an issue that uh, is before the, uh, the government at the moment, I guess, which is the sale tax on, on theater tickets and, and the entertainment area that is just going to cripple, um, you know, non-profits. And you think one of the great things about this university is that there are fantastic kids being generated out of the music school, the art school, architecture, and, and certainly in our drama school we, we have got you know, fabulous people. And one of the great issues I think in Pittsburgh is, is building a world in which they can live here and make their art here. Uh, and everybody now has to go off to New York or they go to Chicago or go, go to LA. And if you start taxing tickets on startups, small co-ops, uh, around this wonderful cultural district downtown where you can get a shop front. You, you've actually got facilities here that you can give artists, but the very next thing you're going to tax them on the ticket just seems ludicrous to me. And I think there should be you know, an outcry about it, and, and we should try and reverse it if we can. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Dan Hussein. I'm a PhD student in civil and environmental engineering and I've got an energy company. And I'm gonna ask a controversial question because if it wasn't controversial, there'd be no point in me asking the question. Um, um, so um, you can answer it however you want. Um, I, and I have a feeling that um, governments, they like crisis uh, because it gives them an excuse to do things, take power and things like that. So for in the previous, and I'll keep this short, um, even though it seems like a long question, um, in the previous uh, uh, president, we saw we saw Iraq and weapons of mass destruction. What if what if why isn't anybody taking a more skeptical eye towards this global warming CO2? Um, what if we end up finding that we've spent millions, billions, trillions of dollars on something that was not an issue, and we end up giving governments more power? Why isn't anyone taking a skeptical look at, at this? And so I know this is a controversial question, so I'll let you respond uh, how you wish. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to, uh, well, first of all, thanks for asking it, because you're representing a point of view that um, otherwise might not be heard, and a lot of people ask that question. So, Lester, I'm going to turn to you to um, <laughs> thanks, buddy. hit this one out of nice the park. About you before? <laughs> uh, I think that what we ought to be doing with respect to global climate change right now are those things that we should be doing anyway. The energy efficiency stuff I'm talking about are things that are going to save us money as well as energy. That's what we can work on today. When you're looking at policies which are very expensive and very far out there, maybe we'll get to them someday, but I think by the time we get to them, we're going to have much greater assurance about what is the impact. I think that the science is pretty clear at this point. How much warming there will be for various levels of CO2 in the atmosphere is quite unsure, and what's going to happen with respect to storms and so on is quite unsure. And so there's a whole bunch of things that we need to do today, regardless of whether you raised any question about global climate change. We need to do them now. They're also going to help us deal with global climate change. It will take us long enough to deal with them so that somewhere down the road when we're much more sure about how much we want to do, that's when we'll, the bill will start coming. I'm going to give Byron uh, the, the last word. I'm, I'm sorry, Kyron, the last word. She told me it rhymes with Byron, and I actually knew I'd do that at some point. Right. <laughs> so I think that's an, an important question to ask. And I like the way Lester responded, that there are things we should be doing anyway, whether mm -hmm. you agree with global warming, that it exists at all. But the fundamental underlying problem um, is something that um, I think we should all be troubled about. Anytime something becomes re religion-like in politics, um, that's when bad policy happens. 
I think the whole democratic peace debate is an example of what we're actually now experiencing with the debate about global warming. Um, both scholars and people in Washington have shut many down who've tried to argue that democracies, in fact, do fight each other. Um, the empirical record is pretty strong that um, there have been wars um, between and among democracies, and democracy is relatively um, new in world history. But what drove the Bush doctrine was this kind of blind faith and the belief that if you can democratize countries that may not want to go in that direction, you will increase the zone of, um, of peace because you've increased the zone of democratic states. So I'm not saying that um, global warming is um, necessarily a, a farce, but what I am saying is that religion in politics of this nature does lead often to very dangerous and bad public policy decisions. Great. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap it up at this point. And I just want to um, quickly point out a, a few things that leapt out from this discussion for me. Um, sort of seven takeaways that I'd share with the group. One is that leadership still matters. You know, I think the display that we saw from um, the Prime Minister illustrates how important leadership really is. Uh, he was exemplifying being the tall poppy, I think, in that case. Um, second, a lesson for us as we, in, in, in this room, those of us who are connected to what Pittsburgh is doing, one of the ways in which Australia turned a corner, and I, I loved um, Mark's points on this, that was to recognize how connected it was to the rest of the world. So understanding the ways in which we're connected is vitally important. Um, third is how important, given the complexities of the problems that we face today, is a coordinated response. So again, not only appreciating connectedness, but also appreciating the next step, which is that you therefore have to reach out and work with others to figure out what best to do about it. Um, there's a theme forth around technology, uh, and, but what I, what I liked about the discussion that happened here um, was this focus that Audrey in particular brought to um, the focus on the, the unusual, which I think Carnegie Mellon exemplifies so well, working at the intersections and marrying um, ideas in new and different ways. Uh, fifth was this idea that you have to think about, even in a connected world, how things play at home. And that may be um, in an international context, looking at how it plays in your home country, or if you're a political leader, uh, appreciating how it will play um, among your electorate. Uh, sixth, the focus on pragmatism, um, really getting b beneath the, ideo the ideology or the assumptions and focusing on understanding the science. As Lester said, no, it's really involved. Um, and I think that that's an important lesson that Kyron pointed out too in terms of policy, at least having some willingness to question the, the accepted truths. Finally, there's a thought that um, is, is ironic given how few of us are left in the room, but it's the question of who's not in the room, um, which you know, I think we, we talked about a bit, uh, but probably not enough that there, um, th this is a debate that we're privileged to have, that a lot of the world is not privileged to have, and so asking how we're going to represent them and make sure that their voices are heard as well is, I think, a key theme. I want to thank the panel very much for sharing your time and insights, and thank you all for sticking around for this. It was a pleasure.